Good day, my name is Jan Kuper and I will give a presentation on the use of Clash for hardware design. So let me share my screens. Hardware design by Clash. Um, we are working at a company called Cubay Logic in the Netherlands. So let me first tell a few words about Cubay Logic. It's an FPGA services company. It started in 2016 as a spin-off of the University of Twente after some 10 years of re research. I founded it together with Christian Bai, a student, later a PhD student from the first beginning of the project. Last year, we got a participation of Demcon, which is a mechatronic supplier in the Netherlands. And at the moment we are with seven people and growing. Um, we worked in quite a few projects successfully, among which deep learning and neural networks pro, uh, projects, uh, satellite communication by laser beams, some processor design, differential equation simulation, and some more. Then about Clash. And the first remark that I want to make is that uh, Clash, uh, had the perspective of Clash on hardware design is coming from semantics and functionality. Clash is both a hardware description language and a programming language, and it's based on Haskell, a functional language. And from Haskell, you can compile to Verilog, to System Verilog, and to VHDL. Clash is different from traditional hardware description language in the sense that you have very high level, very strong abstraction mechanisms. And besides, it's very straightforward to simulate and test your design at every stage of, uh, in, in your design process. We're also different from mainstream high level synthesis tools in the sense that Clash is not starting from a traditional mainstream programming language such as C or C++, because these are typically aiming at programming for a CPU. And second, the second difference with uh, mainstream HLS is that a compilation of Clash into a hardware description language is structure preserving, which gives you explicit control of architecture details. Then a last remark about uh, globally about Clash is that it is an open source system and companies in the world use it for various applications and we are aware of AI applications, financial algorithms and process design in case in, in, in particular risk five. Very pleasant for us is that somebody outside the company of QB Logic took the initiative to start a book on class that now is in preparation and very nice to know for us okay let's turn to the example that steve already introduced a ring architecture where packages travel over a ring from one node to the other and they consist of a destination address and some content and it's good to know packages on the ring have priority so sometimes a package coming from the node has to wait and of course, there are buffers on the ring, but let's uh, focus on the functionality and make a little bit more abstract picture of this ring network where the router only is recognizable as some function. Um, so let's, let's go to the definition of the router. It has three inputs, an address coming from the node. We assume that the address that the router has or uses is given to it by the node. There is a package coming from the ring, there is a package coming from the node, and as outputs, it will send a package to the ring or and or to the node, and it will send a boolean to the node to tell whether its package was sent or not, and it has to retry. So in, because the package from the ring has priority, we first have to look into that, and that can be of two different forms. It can be a package with a destination and a content, and it can be no package. Um, in the case that it is a real package, we still have to check whether the package arrived at its destination address or whether it should move on to the rest of the ring. 
So you can now use the variable dest that was just introduced on the left hand side as a name for that field in the package and compare it to the address that is known to the router. I'll later show you how. Um, and in the other cases, well, then you have to fill in the three um, values for what goes to the ring, what goes to the node, and the value of the Boolean variable retry, where I will indicate which is which by commands in the top line. And if the um, address and the destination are already the same, then you have to send to the node what comes from the ring. You can send what comes from the node to the ring, and you can tell uh, that uh, the node does not have to retry uh, the sending. Um, so in order to finalize this definition, we turn it into a function which gets the other, the address as a first argument so that you can use it in the case expression. Second argument is the package that comes from the ring and the third, the package that comes from the node. node. Note that arguments are separated by spaces rather than by commas. What I want to tell a little bit more about now is this package uh, thing that is a data type, but that plays the role of an embedded language. Um, you can then also have this fully polymorphic uh, by the small variable a, which stands for the content, and you can later fill that in, but for now the, pack the type is fully polymorphic in its content of the packages. And nevertheless, you will have protection by the type system. Uh, let me. Um, an easy error that occurs here is that packages can be sent to addresses that do not exist. And in that case, uh, packages will keep traveling around over the ring indefinitely and ultimately block the ring for any communication at all. So in order to tackle that, you may add a field to the package data type for the source address. And then in the pattern matching in the case expression, you have a separate variable for that source address. And you can add a clause for if the source is equal to the address where we are now. That will mean that the package traveled around the ring already once. And so you can throw it away and fill in the right hand side uh, appropriately. Of course, you can have other extensions, for example, for a counter, for the size of the package, for the protocol, and so on. Um, that abstraction mechanism for embedded languages is, uh, gives you a lot of semantic clarity. It's very flexible and very pleasant to specify your um, designs. It's very practical, for example, in the case of an assembly language for some CPU, um, because every instruction can then be modeled as a clause in that data type and registered addresses and so on will be parameters to uh, the uh, case to the to the constructor of that clause it's just a normal data type so you can define functions on it um, in your case expression you can do pattern matching on all the uh, clauses and give local names to the different um, fields just as we saw before uh, and um, one further example then is that you are protected by the type system against, for example, uh, spelling errors. And what I already said, though it looks as a specification, it is also executable and translatable to a hardware description language for which you, of course, need to encode the different um, situations to bit patterns. Clash offers for that a default encoding, but in practice, you also um, may need a, a specific encoding, for example, for the risk five. For that, you have the possibility to define your own custom encoding. Now, I already mentioned the polymorphism, and we'll come back later to that. Then, now we have the definition for one router. We have to combine the different routers into a ring. And for that, we can use higher order functions. Um, let me go to these higher order functions 
um, which, as you can see here, uh, define the architecture structurally. So for example, you have a fold operation, which gets a binary operation as a first argument, then a starting value and a sequence of value where it accumulates over that sequence with that operation. A zip width is, uh, gets a binary operation and two vectors, and zip width combines then these two vectors element-wise with the operation. There are more examples such as map accumulate and a two-dimensional one such as the Cartesian product with an operation which combines two vectors and all elements with all elements of both vectors. That last one can be used very practical for matrix multiplication uh, where in the left you have a matrix A and at the top you have a matrix B because matrix multiplication is a Cartesian product with a dot product <coughs> of the rows of matrix A and the columns of matrix B. And the dot product itself is also defined as a combination of two higher order functions, first pairwise multiplication and then an addition. This definition of matrix multiplication, for example, is executable and, translation, and translatable into a hardware description language. But as we all know, matrices can become very big. So this won't fit as a fully parallel uh, architecture on your FPGA. Now for that in class, you have quite a few standard refinement steps for area time trade-off and to do things over time instead of over space. For example, to cut your matrix in sub-matrices and to combine them later on to analyze it as a systolic array to add pipelining and so on. Now, the higher order function that is needed to combine the router functions into a ring is zip width three. If you look at the router function, it has three arguments. So zip width three is here the obvious way to go. And you can combine then the router function with three vectors, one of addresses, one of the buffers on the ring that produce the, uh, the packages that come from the ring and one of the uh, packages that come from the nodes. The zip width three only gives you then a sequence of three tuples, if you remember the definition of the router, and you have to unpack them into a three tuple of sequences instead of a sequence of three tuples. So here is the full definition of the ring where I want to mention the last line because the last output of the last router has to be shifted into the whole sequence so that uh, here you effectively produce the ring uh, of, the, of the packages. You can simulate quite straightforwardly. Well, I gave some nice uh, syntactic form to the output, but that is only syntactic sugaring. Um, where every, every line uh, depicts a clock cycle, and I tried it for four uh, routers, where the left column uh, shows the package that was sent, and the right column shows the package that was received, so you can check whether the package was received. It's also feasible that some packages had to be sent um, more than once um, until it was sent and received at its destination. Before we now can generate a hardware description language from this, we still have to make one step, that is the polymorphism. Uh, that is very pleasant for experimenting and designing, but hardware is uh, strict in how many wires you use for your types and, and so on. So you have to make it monomorphic rather than polymorphic. But happily, functionality is separated from its type, so you can do this by choosing a specific type. And then apart from, let's say, the type checking and for, for error detection, you can do so also use types for determine your choices for the hardware. Um, so the definition of the embedded language for package was as is shown again here. And suppose we have a type big A that is concretely defined, well, can be anything. 
then we can use that, for example, in the type of the router function by using the package constructor as a function to the type. So package with big A will fill in the big A in the definition of the embedded language and will set the type of the content to this big A. And this type of the router function can be read by the first thing is the type of the first argument, the second is the, are the type of the second argument, and so on. So here is a specific router function for a specific content of, um, of packages. Now you can have many different uses of types also for clock domains, which gives you type safe clock domain crossings. And now we can translate our code into a Verilog system Verilog or VHDL by one of the appropriate commands. The compilation for any of these three um, languages took around seven seconds. Uh, and on the right hand side, you see an example of a fragment of uh, generated Verilog. In general, the performance of your results is uh, within 10% 10, 10 of handwritten VHDL in general. Okay, a last um, word about the abstraction level. Class offers truly model-based design by the fact that uh, Haskell is close to mathematics and which gives you a formal model, which at the same time is executable, giving you a golden reference that you can use for checking all your intermediate define, uh, refinement steps in your design, because these, uh, refinement steps are done within the same language and you can immediately simulate and test them, which gives you also a fast design space exploration, plus the fact that it was structure preserving, giving you a predictable performance. Now, last remarks in our experiment, in our experience, no simulation in, in a HDL is needed anymore. You get a first time right design often which shortens your time to market quite a bit. And finally, Clash approaches hardware design um, from the functionality and the technology and not from how we learn to think about CPU programming using C++ for, for example. So this were my slides. Thank you for your attention and looking forward to your, um, to your questions. Thanks a lot.